Thanks for joining us today. We really hope that this ministry has impacted your life and blessed your heart. And if it has, we would love to hear your story. Send us an email. Tell us about you. Send an email to stories at edgewaterchurch.com. And also, if you'd like to partner financially with this ministry, you may do so at our website, edgewaterchurch.com. Or you can download the app through the iTunes Store or through Google Play. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for watching today. Now prepare your hearts for the message. in the midst of a series on the book of Joshua and the man Joshua. You've talked about the transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua. You've talked about the, the battle at Jericho, some of the other battles that have been fought. Uh, you've talked about his incredible faith, his commitment to God, his commitment to leading God's people. In today's story, um, there's a couple of sub-stories running, running together in this story. Uh, it's happened after the Battle of Jericho and after the battle at Ai, Ai uh, where the Israelite people have defeated superior forces, superior numbers of forces. Uh, and so um, the people of Gibeon, the Gibeonites, uh, have decided that uh, if you can't beat them, you ought to join them. And so they, uh, they decide that they're going to become part of the Israelites. They actually employ a little trickery. Uh, their leaders dress up as beggars and people along the road and uh, get themselves into the community and then let the Israelites know that they'd like to be part of the community. Uh, and the Israelites say yes. So there's another group that decides they still want to fight the Israelites. And those five kings get together with their five armies. And they say, we've heard the Gibeonites are going to, you know, have affiliated themselves and become part of the Israelite community. So they're going to, uh, we, we need to destroy them. And so the five kings get together, pool their armies together, and they're going to attack Gibeon. And the people of Gibeon send a message to Joshua and the Israelites that says, look, we know we're new members of the community, but we need you to protect us right now. Joshua and the Israelite leaders, without blinking, decide that they're going to protect the new members of the community. And so they march all night and arrive at Gibeon to take on the five armies. And in the midst of the battle, there's something spectacular that happens. It comes near the end of the passage I'm going to read to you. But it's the passage where Joshua commands the sun and the moon to stand still so that there'll be enough time for the Israelite army to finish its mission. So it's a fabulous story with much to speak to us about this day. I'm in the 10th chapter of Joshua. I'm going to start reading at verse 6, if, if you're following along. And the Gibeonites sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgal, saying, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who live in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal. He and all the fighting force with him, all the mighty warriors. 
The Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who inflicted a great slaughter on them at Gibeon, chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Haran, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makedah. As they fled before Israel, while they were going down the slope of Beth Haran, the Lord threw down huge stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the Israelites killed with the sword. On the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemy. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, part of what I enjoy about preaching at churches where I'm not the pastor, something I've been able to enjoy the last six years while I've been on Bishop Carter's staff, uh, is that um, I get to come into the church and mess with you a little bit and then leave and let your leadership clean up. You know, that's all well and good, but now that I'm going to be your district superintendent in another eight days, I, I've realized that I'm kind of the chief cleaner upper, so maybe I shouldn't be quite so aggressive about that. huh? But, uh, uh, and I do want to tell you, um, between Dan and David, you, you have superb pastoral leadership here. I hope you fully appreciate what you have. So, um, I've, I've had the privilege of, of working with the leadership of uh, this church for the last four, four and a half years because my previous position, my current soon to end position, has been director of new church development for the whole annual conference. And so I was involved with the planning and the implementation of uh, the new campus you have going so well over at uh, over at Northport. Uh, so uh, I, I feel like I'm among friends here. Um, and I was talking with David this week about this message that both he and I are, are giving this morning. Um, and we're kind of bouncing some ideas back and forth uh, with each other. And he talked about one of the things he was going to focus on was this idea of our audacious God, that, that we have this God that just does audacious and big things. And so I, I began thinking about that, and I, I was thinking to myself, what's the most audacious thing God has done in my life? Because as a preacher, you know, if you can think of like that one great story to begin your message with, you know, it's a great way to start. And so I'm thinking about the things God has done in my life. And, and I suddenly realized that um, maybe the issue isn't whether or not God has done audacious things in my life. Maybe the issue is whether or not I'm willing to take the time to acknowledge the audacious things God has done in my life. So I started thinking of some things like my wife is a cancer survivor. 19 years ago, I had triple bypass surgery. We have a healthy 36-year-old son who spent the first six months of his life in the hospital. We have five healthy children, four wonderful daughters-in-law, and without question, the seven most adorable grandchildren any of you have ever met, okay? Are there any other grandparents here in the room? Okay, I just want to let you know, all of you are fighting for eighth place because I got one through seven covered with our grandkids, okay? So, um, you know, when I think about those things that God has done in my life, I realize that's a pretty audacious list. It's audacious if I'm willing to give God credit. 
for the things God has done and is doing in my life. You know, I'm a birthright Quaker, which means that I have been raised in and surrounded by concepts of peace and peace with your neighbor all my life. So a passage like this one has its challenges for me. But it was a reminder in preparing for this week that no matter what our particular leanings might be, we can always learn more from God's word and we can always learn more when our positions are challenged. So in, in looking at this text, I realize that, that it's at a time when the Israelite people have crossed the Jordan River. Now for 40 years in the wilderness, they've been told, there's this land of milk and honey waiting for you. So I'm sure in their minds, they're thinking, well, once we get across the Jordan, life is going to be good and easy, right? You ever watch how some people present the gospel of Jesus? Say, you know, if you'll just say yes to Jesus, everything's going to be good and easy in your life. You know? Well, everything is going to be good. But I would suggest to you that following Jesus and becoming people of faith is nowhere easy. And most people will tell you if they're really trying to follow Jesus, it can be some of the hardest and most complicated work that they do. The Israelites are facing that, that, very, that very reality. They cross the Jordan, and the first thing they've got to do is fight at Jericho, then fight at Ai, now fight here. But there they are as immigrants in the land. And they're trying to figure out how do we live as people who've kind of been by ourselves in the wilderness with God working on us. And now we're, we're in this land where we have people that speak different languages, people that have different customs, people that, that worship other gods. How do we live in, in this land? And then we have this scene where the, the Gibeonites have said, okay, we, we want to become part of you. And so they're challenged with how do we accept a group of outsiders into our community? That whole concept is an interesting thread that runs through scripture and through this particular story. If you follow the thread of honoring and loving our neighbor and welcoming our neighbor, if you read about it in Deuteronomy, the neighbor that you are supposed to love as you love yourself is someone that's akin, somebody that you're related to. But then when you get into the book of Isaiah, your neighbor that you are supposed to love and accept is someone who is an alien that lives among you that has decided to worship the same God and worship in the same way that you do. But then... We get all the way to Luke and Jesus telling us in the parable of the Good Samaritan, no, your neighbor is anybody. But you are to love as yourself, even the one that has been presented to you as your enemy. So one of the big steps that's taken in that evolution is the step that the Israelite people take in this moment when they say to the Gibeonites, yeah, you can become part of us. And so the Gibeonites say, hey, we're part of you now, and we need you to literally risk your lives for us. God promises to Joshua that they will win, but do you notice the promise of the victory comes after they've already agreed to go protect the Gibeonites? So they attack, they, they march all night. Think of it, this army marched the equivalent of a marathon race overnight to get to this location and then fought all day. And in the, and in the midst of the battle, when they realize that they aren't going to be able to get total victory while there's still daylight, 
Joshua says, God, we, we need you to hold the sun still in the sky so that there'll be enough daylight for us to finish our mission this day. And God holds the sun and the moon in the sky, and there is enough daylight for them to finish. And as I reflected on this passage, I thought about who we are as, as humans. And I, I read a lot of, about this passage. It was really kind of humorous to read some of the comments about this passion, this passage, where uh, some of the more scientific writers were saying, well, there was probably an eclipse that day, and they just didn't have language about how to express it in that time. Or in the midst of the battle, time just went by slowly, so it seemed like the sun was up longer. This reminded me over and over again that in our modern culture and in our modern world, we want certainty more than we want the mystery of God. We want certainty that takes away our need to trust God. I want to the ministries that I've led for the last couple of years and that I will continue to lead even as I become your district superintendent is the Fresh Expressions Initiative and Movement across Florida. Last uh, summer and fall, we went around to a number of churches, uh, really over almost 150 churches in the Florida Conference in a series of meetings. These were churches whose worship attendance was declining and yet they are in areas where the, the area, in the immediate area around the church where the population is growing. So worship declining, population growing. Okay. Now, just so you know, there's over 300 churches in the Florida Annual Conference that are declining in worship attendance where the population is growing, which suggests to me that maybe we've got some work to do about reaching people for Jesus. Amen? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank God you're not in that category. But, uh, um, but anyway, we met with these churches. We were offering financial support for them to start dinner churches. Dinner churches function almost like a second campus of the church, but the strategy is that you offer a free meal someplace away from the main campus of the church, and at that weekly dinner, a story is told about Jesus, and people discuss it around the tables. Now, please. What could be more like Jesus and what could be more like John Wesley than to have a meal together and sit around and talk about Jesus and how Jesus might be life-giving to you? Okay? We talked to these churches, and here's what I heard over and over again. In order for us to do this, one pastor told me, I'd have to run this through five different committees to get approval. Understand, we're willing to support this financially. Another one said, well, we just don't know where we'd get the money and where we'd get the leadership for it. Where have we lost our trust that when we are doing bold things for God, God will take care of the details? Part of where we like certainty over mystery Remember I said I was going to mess with you a little bit? This is, just give you a little warning, this is coming here. We also like the certainty of knowing that our tribe is going to kind of stay the way it is. Now, we all belong to tribes, right? I do, you do. Tribes meaning groups of people that think like we do. I don't know about you, I'm never more comfortable and probably never happier than when I'm in a group of people that think exactly the same way I do. You know? I think we've all got that characteristic, right? And when we invite newcomers into our tribe, usually what we're saying to the newcomer is, we want you to come in so you can be just like us. When really what we should be saying is, how can this newcomer bring to us something that increases our knowledge and our ability to connect with others. You know, Patty and I had to live this. Patty, my wife, is in one of the Sunday school classes this morning. I, for some reason, 
she thought hearing this message four times on a weekend was more than she could tolerate, okay? So. But when Patty and I got married 29 years ago, I had three sons from my first marriage. She had one from her first marriage. So we had to do this blending of the tribes, and we also have a daughter together. So we know something about bringing different tribes together and seeing something more wonderful come out of it than what we had before. I think this story teaches us a few things about how to break up our dependence on certainty. One is an audacious God honors audacious people. An audacious God honors audacious people. It was audacious to think that a group of slaves could overcome Pharaoh's armies, and yet they did. Audacious to think that the Israelite people could survive for 40 years in the wilderness just with God providing manna from heaven and water from rocks and a covering cloud by day and a pillar of fire to guide their way by night. You know, that audacious God and this story teaches us that the more you pray and the more you give opportunities for God to just show off and show what God can do, the less audacious the requests seem to be. Think of Joshua's life. He had grown up in the wilderness. He had seen God provide food from the skies, water from rocks. He'd seen all of this happen. So for Joshua, asking the sun and the moon to stand still didn't seem like all that big of a request because he'd seen what God could do in the past. The Jewish people today celebrate this by remembering every year at Passover the way that God delivered them. We do the same thing. We may not think of it this way, but whenever we celebrate Holy Communion, we are remembering the miracle of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The more you pray and, tr and trust, the less audacious big requests seem. You know, when the sun and the moon stood still, it was a reminder to me that, you know, when God is in the plan, there's always enough of everything. If God's in the plan, there'll be enough time. If God's in the plan, there'll be enough money. If God's in the time, there'll be enough leaders. Three years ago, Bishop Carter said publicly for the first time that by 2025, we need to have a goal of having 500 fresh expressions of church across the Florida Annual Conference. That was a goal, a nine-year goal, to have 500 fresh expressions of church. We didn't know where the money was going to come from. We didn't know where the leaders were going to come from. We didn't know how we were going to do this. There was no strategic plan laid out for it. We just said, this is what we need, and we're going to trust God to do it. So here we are, three years later, this past annual conference, two weeks ago, I had the privilege of declaring to the Florida Annual Conference that as of today, we have 301 fresh expressions of church across the Florida Annual Conference. Yeah. And I'm telling you, there is a wave of the Holy Spirit that is flowing across this conference through this movement. We have people meeting for prayer and Holy Communion in the front area of a tattoo parlor. We have people meeting at Mexican restaurants for burritos and Bibles, a Bible study of people that don't even come to church they aren't showing up in anybody's church on Sunday morning, but they're in those Bible studies. It's grown so big, they've had to go to multiple offerings at a larger facility. We've got people celebrating God while they walk their dogs at a dog park, and runners that are celebrating God before and after running a 5K every Saturday morning. It is happening all over this state. I'm also challenged, maybe the most of all, in this passage by what it really means to welcome people into our community, into our tribe, if you will. 
This passage tells me that people of faith, when we're welcoming somebody new in, we better be prepared to go all the way for those people. I think this is a critical question for the future of the church. Not this church, not any one specific church, just the church. You know, it used to be in the church that our challenge was how friendly can we be because we were used to having people visit the church. So when I began in ministry, the challenge was let's make everybody friendly and let's notice the visitor in our midst and let's make sure that as soon as worship is over, we don't gather in our holy little huddles of our friends, but we go out and meet the other people that are there. That was the challenge in those days. It's a different world today. It's a different world because it isn't natural, a natural part of the process for people to visit churches on Sunday morning. We've got to be committed to going out where people are already gathering and meeting them and showing them that we are not what they think we are. Showing them that we are totally committed to their lives and their relationship with Jesus Christ. This story teaches us that we're, when we're in and welcoming people into our community, we've got to be prepared to go all the way. The Israelites put their lives on the line to go protect the new members of their community. Had an experience with one of those people we need to reach. In a ministry my wife and I are involved with called Residents Encounter Christ. It's a ministry that happens at county jails. We go into the jail for a weekend and work with the residents of the jail. Because they're in a jail, that usually means they're going to be released sometime in the next 6 to 12 months. But about two years ago in the Sumter County Jail, I met a young man named Chris. Chris had this huge contusion on the back of his head. And in talking to him, I found out he'd gotten that contusion because he'd been hit over the head with a beer bottle in a fight. Got to know Chris uh, even better. He told me the backstory to that. Chris had been out fishing with his then 10-year-old son. His wife's boyfriend, now understand, when you start dealing with jail ministry and prison ministry, you get into some stories that may not line up like, you know, the, the traditional family. But this boyfriend had been told by Chris's wife, who had left Chris six years ago, they had never divorced, but had left him to raise four children, had let Chris know she was interested in coming back and reconciling. The boyfriend wasn't happy about that and chased Chris down while he was fishing with his son, started a fight with him. The 10-year-old son stepped into the middle of the fight. And the result was that both Chris and the boyfriend were arrested for child endangerment, and that's why he was in jail. Chris has never been in a, never been in a church in his life. But on the second day in the afternoon when we were there working with him, Chris came up to me and he said, Pastor Dan, I want to be baptized. I said, Chris, usually what we do when somebody wants to be baptized is once you're released, we'll connect you with a local church and you can be baptized at that church and then let that community surround you and support you. Now, I got to tell you as a quick sidelight, one of our real challenges is finding churches that will really accept and support somebody just coming out of jail. Chris looked at me and he said, nah, that's not for me. He said, I want to be baptized here because here is where I met Jesus Christ. We baptized Chris. That experience is one of many that led me to be part of a new church that we are starting. The Florida Annual Conference is starting a new church inside the Lowell Correctional Facility in Reddick, Florida. We aren't just sending a chaplain there, we are assigning and appointing a full-time United Methodist pastor to start a church inside that prison. It is awesome. The Lowell Correctional Facility is the largest women's correctional facility in the United States. Over the next three years, 
over 1,900 women will be released back into Florida. And we're looking for churches and people that are willing to accept them and nurture them and fight for them in their faith. Because we know that the first 30 days after release is the critical time period where we ask whether or not they're going to go back to their old tribe or whether they're going to join a new tribe. It's the difference between a tribe that guarantees death and a tribe that can give them life. So here's the question that I want to leave you with today. How audacious is your God? Is your God audacious enough? Is your God big enough for you to find the Chris's that are going to be in your life and fight for them to get connected with this community and with a faith in Jesus Christ. How audacious is your God? Will you pray with me? God of each and every one of us and God of every person you will bring into our lives, we give you thanks for your power we give you thanks for the strength you show us every day. We give you thanks for the miracles that happen every day that we are so often too busy to acknowledge. But God, we pray now for a big faith. We pray now that we can be the people that others will say they have an audacious God and they have an audacious faith. Give us that faith, O oh God. Give us that strength that we may rely completely on your power. We ask this trusting in the love and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.